All right. There we go. It, the, the problem is if you don't record it, it's not recorded. And if you want it, it's gone. So, well, let's let's start with you, Aaron. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, um, I'm currently living in uh, the greater Tampa Bay area of Florida. Um, by trade, I'm a psychotherapist, a licensed mental health uh, counselor. And um, yeah, for I guess the past four years now, I've been um, I've been doing counseling by video only, so I no longer have an office. Um, so yeah, it's it's funny to be because usually I'm on your end of things. You know, tell me about yourself. Like, what brings you, <laughs> brings you this little this little world? Um, so yeah, it's it's very weird to be like, oh man, this is this is what it feels like to be one of my clients. So this is good. I mean, this like really allows me to to really kind of get things from their perspective now. That that whole video counseling thing, which of course sort of arose in COVID. Before then, it was like you know, no, you got to be in person. And and then suddenly after COVID, it's, it's uh, most of the people I know, especially if they don't, if, especially if they have limited means and insurance is paying, it's video. And that's Yeah, it's, it's really strange. Uh, I, I started doing video only counseling. Yeah, I guess about a year before COVID. And it was all tech. It was all like tech um, oh. employees, tech executives and things. They were the only ones that, that seemed to be interested in video and then COVID comes along and suddenly I'm like swamped with like client. There were days where I was working six days a week during, during COVID. And it was, it was really interesting just to see like this vast array of, of clients no longer just, um, you know, educated people within the yeah. tech industry. Now I have like this whole spectrum of, of people coming in, but I, I find it's, um, it, it's so much easier for me to get, um, to get information out of people because they feel comfortable. They're in their own setting. I had a great office. Um, so for years I was based out of the, the, the Northern Virginia, basically the suburbs of DC. And that was where my office was located. And it was a great office, but I could tell people had a hard time, you know, coming into my environment because it's an alien environment, it's a foreign environment. And so it took a lot longer for them to get comfortable with me and to really form that, that therapeutic alliance um, that we needed in order to work from. Whereas with, with video counseling now, like oftentimes the first session people, you know, describe like very personal things, very difficult things um, and feel comfortable going into to detail. I've had exactly that experience in terms of pastoral ministry, because of course, I never did pastoral ministry over a Zoom call. I mean, uh, you go to somebody's house or they come to your office or you meet in a coffee shop. I mean, that's that's where you would do these things. And then be, a, you know, before COVID even with just talking to people that had been watching my videos, I was, I was amazed how quickly they sort of got down to business. I had a, a pastoral mentor of mine when I was in college and seminary. He um he always had a clock behind the 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 chair. You know, someone would come into his office, they'd sit there, he'd sit there. I always had a clock. He said they, they never get to anything until 10 minutes before the appointment is done. And, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so he, had, he had all sorts of tricks and stuff to try and get them because of course 10 minutes before the appointment is done and then you know, next time they come in, maybe we'll get into it a little sooner, but it's just like, no, you're exactly right. I'd never put that together in terms of space and location, but it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. Well, anyway, I got distracted. So, okay. So you're a, so you're a psychotherapist and right. well, tell me, tell me about the home you grew up in. Uh, well, I, <laughs> not that you've ever thought about this before. <laughs> I uh, I grew up in a, a, a really small town in Vermont and when it was like a town of like 1500 people maybe um, uh, so I'm I'm 49 I'll, I'll be 50 in, in six months so I, I grew up uh, pretty much in the 80s that's like what I really remember is uh, is the, the 1980s a little bit of like the end of the 70s but definitely much a lot more memories from uh, from the 80s and so, um, in Northern Vermont, you, 
you basically have two ethnic groups. You're either you're either Irish American or you're French Canadian American. Yep. And that's basically it. You're like one of those two ethnic enclaves and that's that's where you're coming from. And so I, I grew up, uh, yeah, in a, a French Canadian um, enclave. Uh, my grandparents um, came to the U.S. Uh, out of uh, Montreal. Yep. And um, I have a lot of fond memories of, of my father taking us into Montreal and visiting some of his aunts. They would be, I guess, my great aunts. Um, they were they were nuns in uh, in Montreal and. Um, he had some cousins that were also priests as well. And so, you know, meeting them and, and things like that and, and going to like going to, to, to Latin mass at, uh, at Notre Dame. And, um, it's funny, I, you, I know you were talking about, um, uh, what you say the other day, uh, we're all Protestants now. Yeah. And that really, that really, um, that really stuck with me because going to like, going to mass in Montreal versus going to mass in my little town in, in, in Vermont, you know, it's like this church does not look like a Catholic, you know, it looks more like a Protestant church. There's, there's very few um, beautiful statuary or, yeah. or other artwork inside. Um, you know, you have like a, the only thing that would denote it um, that, that it's a Catholic church is the crucifix. But if you were to take out the crucifix, I mean, it would probably just look like, I don't know, like a Methodist church or something. Yeah. Um, but that being said, um, it was a, a, a very strong French Canadian Catholic church uh, mm. that I grew up in. You sang the hymns in, in French. Um, and uh, that was, that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. Um, and uh, Did you yeah. know what you were singing. Was there enough French that you picked up along the way that, um, I'm, I'm because so it's a different than being in Quebec where there's this, you know, <laughs> everywhere else in Canada, well, y'all have to learn French, but in Quebec, you really have to know it because we're going to talk right. it. And if you don't, I mean, it's, it's, I did when I was younger, but, um, you know, after my, my grandparents passed because mm. their, their English wasn't great. So I had to use French to, to communicate with them. Um, I unfortunately just. I got out of practice and yeah. forgot a lot. I'm I'm still very good at reading it. Like if you put like a newspaper in front of me, I can like translate. But in terms of like auditory and like verbal comprehension, um, still kind of still kind of squirrely. Uh, every once in a while, I'll watch like a French movie and I I can pick up um, you know bits and pieces here and there. But uh, I'm just like so so rusty that uh, yeah, I, I I would not be I would not be very good in, in terms of uh, being a, a translator, but um, yeah, I mean I I so I was part of that church. I, I was an altar boy. I think when I was up from eleven to twelve, um, and uh, yeah, that that was basically Did you go to public the school. So initially, I went to public school um, all the way up into eighth grade, and then. Once I got to high school, the the public high school in the area where I'm from, I mean, it, it's basically desi it was designed for farmers, the kids of farmers, and yep. so uh, my parents my parents were very blue collar, but they wanted my sister and I to to go to college and you know become have like a more white collar profession. Yep. So um, as soon as high school came, they said, you know, you're going to Catholic school, you're going, you know, the big city, which is like Burlington, which is like 75,000 people. Yeah. Um, so they, they, they sent me into, uh, they sent me into to put the, the Catholic high school in, in the city. And um, yeah, I, I went there very, I mean, I don't know if it still is, but it was, it was very rigorous back then. Like I had to learn Latin. I, 30 years later, I still remember being in Latin class with Sister Margaret Mary and having to translate um, passages of um, the, the Sumo Theologica by St. Thomas Aquinas. I think about that now. It's like, man, that was that was, you know, in graduate school. They weren't that <laughs> they weren't they weren't that uh, yeah. they weren't that heavy. Um, so, yeah, uh, it was uh, it was. I think it was, I think it was a Dominican run school. I think it was the Dominicans that, that ran at least the, the, the religious programs. Yeah. Um, at so the, how, was, the high how was religion for you 
as a teenager? Was it something you were interested in, something devoted to, something oh, you shaped against? Oh, oh. Now we're getting into the meat of things. Uh, of course, that's what we're here for. <laughs> Why waste um, time? <laughs> yeah, so um, essentially, I, I think of my, my, my spiritual, religious life pre-divorce and post-divorce mm. because my parents divorced when I was, when I was 13. Oh, and, like my entire world, like just was obliterated at that point. Everything completely changed. Um, so my mother wasn't raised Catholic. My mother converted to become, um, a Catholic when she married my, my father. Well, basically my father got my mother pregnant and, my father's father was like, yeah, you're going to marry this girl or you're going to be ostracized from the family. You know, she, literally, you know, like a, yeah. a shotgun wedding, essentially, yeah. without the shotgun. But yeah. it was the threat was implied. And so my parents got married and um, they just they had a very difficult relationship. They they just were not they just were not uh, compatible with with one another. And my, my father had a lot of personal issues as well. Um, so my mother really tried to, 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 to stick it out. I mean, she, she stuck mm. it out for, um, for like 18 years. Um, but finally my father, his, his drinking was getting out of control. He was starting to become violent. And my mother said, you know, this is, this is it. I've had yeah. enough. Yeah. And so they get divorced and, like the divorce itself, like didn't really, um, I wasn't like that, that, um, I wasn't that sad about like the two of them splitting yeah. because the relationship was just so horrible that it was like, finally, yeah. finally you two yeah. decided you can't live under the same roof. Yeah. But what was, what was really hard on me was that, um, my father's family just being very strict, you know, French Canadian Catholic, um, they, they, they kind of just turned on my mother and, and they ostracized her from the family. And that, that kind of included us as well. And so no longer would we go to um, every year, like they would have huge like Christmas celebrations. One, my, my dad had 10 brothers and sisters. So there were 11 of them in the family. And so I have like a hundred cousins on, on that side of the family. And so they would have these huge elaborate holiday celebrations and my sister and I were just like no longer uh, invited to these these celebrations. And on top of that, my poor mother. Um, so the the church that I went to, the Catholic church that I went to, the priest wasn't wasn't a bad man, but he was he was a very weak leader in that he didn't really run the church. There were a group of like literal church ladies who basically ran the church and they didn't like my mother being a divorced woman. And, and also you have to understand that like back, back then, back in that, those days, my mother was a very good looking woman when she was younger. She looked almost exactly like um, princess Diana. Like if you can picture princess Diana, like that's what my mother looked like back in the 1980s. So she's wow. this attractive woman who's now divorced and, oh. and my mother, some of the uh, some of the men in the church like hitting on her after after my parents uh, divorce. Oh. And so these church ladies confronted my mother after my um, after my uh, my my confirmation. I was I think it was in eighth grade at the time. And they basically told her that, like, you're not welcome here anymore. And my mother rightly so like lost it, you know, and uh I, I just remember like after, after confirmation, being in my little confirmation outfit, my mother telling me to like, go to the car, you know, go wait for me in the car and just hearing like her, just like yelling at, you know, you know, the, uh, the, the church ladies and, uh, you know, the, the priest, the father. And, um, <laughs> she gets in the car and just looks at me and is like, you're not going to that church anymore. And, uh, confirmation. Done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, know, you can you can make up your own mind from now so on. Did you stop going to church entirely, or did you go to a different Catholic church, or did you go to a Protestant church? No. Um, so 
I so I every every two weeks I would go I would spend the weekend with my father. Oh yeah, and and he was he was still going to church. He was in a, he was living in a different town, and and my father was was very much. Um, I don't know. I, I go back and forth on this. I I wish I had I had had the chance to ask him before he died, but I I feel like he was really a, a, an atheist, um, and he went to church just because like that was what was expected of him. Sure. Um, you know, he came from, you know, a yeah. large you know, traditional yeah. family where you had all sorts of family members going into um, the taking up the clerical collar. So I think he just did it what was expected, because the reason why I say this is because we, we literally went to this church that was basically designed for um, uh, tourists. And so there wasn't really much of a community in this particular church. And it was known as the, the, the priest there had the shortest like homily out of like all the other churches in the area. And so that's, that's the reason why my father, you know, would go there was because, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, 40 minutes, we're in and out and it's, you know, we're good to go. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I would, I would go to that church with him, but, you know, would just not get like anything out of it whatsoever. Um, and it's not like, you know, I, I would be able to ask like, um, you know, deep theological questions with my yeah. father. Like, it's just yeah. not, just not there. Um, so yeah, there, there was, once that happened, it's like, um, um, it's like all the, 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 the spiritual, um, binds that, that I had in, inside of me were just like cut. And, uh, I just really felt like, well, if this is what it means to be, you know, Catholic, then like, like why, 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 you know, why follow this path? Like these people seem ridiculous. Um, I don't see like a whole lot of, you know, saintly behavior among like uh, this, this particular group, you know, all I see is, is a lot of drama and just a, a lot of just very damaged people. Um, and yeah, I, I, at that point, I, I really did, you know, turn away from the, the church and I don't think I ever really like turned away from, from God at all because um I, I continued to, to search and I, I remember getting in a debate in, in my religion class with, uh, uh, God bless him, brother Adrian, I wish he was still alive. Cause I would go and, and apologize to him. Um, you know, he would always, he would always talk about, um, like how impossible it was for, for those of us to convert to something else. And I remember debating with him, like, well, you know, I was at the time I'd started reading, um, his name is it uh dt suzuki the guy who was very famous for writing a lot of um buddhism texts um i started reading a bunch of um zen buddhism and couldn't understand like half of it but uh i don't know i guess i was just trying to be edgy at the time or something but i would bring like these these buddhist texts to like study to my study period and sit there and and, and read them and so i i was debating um uh, brother Adrian about, well, you know, what if I want to become a Buddhist? I think I'm going to convert to Buddhism. And he's like, Aaron, you're like, you're, you're like a bag of tea. You've been steeped in, you know, French Canadian Catholicism your entire life. You can't just become a Buddhist. And he had some other points he was making, but I, I just wasn't listening. I'm like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to become a Buddhist and, you know, I'm going to show you and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, I, I didn't become a Buddhist, but, uh, um, I, I, I was just in such a, a rebellious phase at, at that point in, in my life. And, um, you know, none of the, 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 the kids that I went to high school with didn't seem particularly, they were also much like, um, much like my father. They're just kind of going through the motions. Yeah. We go to mass, we, we take the Eucharist, but then, you know, on the weekends we party, you know, yeah. smoke, weed, drink, have sex. Like it's yeah. not, you know, it's nothing that uh, it's just part of, of what we have to do in order to to get through school. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, really, at that point, I I, uh, I I would occasionally pick up like a book 
on just kind of general spirituality here or there, um, but really didn't do any kind of uh, deep soul searching at all. In fact, if anything, by the time I got into college in my 20s, I was just living as a, a hedonist. I mean, that, that was probably my, my, my main spirituality at that point in my life was just being a, a hedonism and just experiencing as much uh, pleasure, physical pleasure as, as I possibly could. Um, but uh, it's really funny because, uh, I, I, you know, my mother was also in, in the same boat in that she was kind of done with, with, with Catholicism because of what happened with the, the church. And so she decided she was going to look into some, some, some Protestant churches. Um, that did not go well, because the thing about my mother is that she's basically a folk Catholic. And what I mean by that is that um, she has a, a strong devotion to, to Mary. And I never really asked her about it, but I, I, I'm pretty sure the, the reason was because my mother had actually lost her, her firstborn child. My, oh. my mother, Christopher, um, he had died from, um, from SIDS when he was a, he was a This baby. is the child that they married for. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that, 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 that'll keep a therapist busy for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and then, of course, you've got a devotion to Mary. You're going to New England Protestant churches. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, that I mean, that, I think because because my mom losing her firstborn son just was able to identify with Absolutely. Mary so yeah. much. Yeah, and that yeah. that's the only reason I can I can come up with why she had like such an intense devotion to her. Yeah. But yeah, the, the Protestant uh, pastors apparently weren't too fond of that. In fact, one of them kicked kicked her out of a, a bible study group because he thought she was a goddess worshiper <laughs> basically accused her of being a goddess worshiper. oh, oh and Lord uh mercy yeah so so she tried a, a couple of different um protestant churches but none of them kind of stuck so um she just kind of uh i don't know i guess kind of became her own thing yeah and yeah. uh just went from there yeah wow so when did you decide to get into, did you, did you get in psycho into psychology to become a psychotherapist or were you just interested in psychology first? Uh, none actually. I mean, I, my, my, uh, my undergraduate is, I have a, a, an undergraduate degree in psychology, but I didn't go to graduate school, uh, immediately. Hmm. Um, after I, uh, I graduated from college, I actually ended up becoming a police officer. Oh, and um, did that for for several years um, throughout In a big my city or a small small town? No, no, a uh, small town. Okay, and um, but uh, in my my late my late twenties, I guess, yeah, um, because of uh, some things that had happened at work, started developing some some pretty severe PTSD. And, but I didn't, I didn't know it at the time. I just started having these panic attacks out of nowhere. And I didn't understand why I was having panic attacks. And so uh, I, I found this really great therapist. Uh, the guy had been a um, former um, Vietnam vet, had been a, an outlaw biker, um, had scars on his face from getting into knife fights <laughs> in bars. <laughs> And uh, was just a, a, a really great, ended up being a, a, a little bit of a clinical mentor for me for, for a while after, a, after graduate school. But um, yeah, so I found him and, and started going into to counseling and um, just had a really good experience, really positive experience with him. Um, and then I started asking him questions about like, well, how, how did you get into this? Like, yeah. why, why did you decide to do this? And so... He um, he went into his story and 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 told me a lot about that. So I was like, ah, I think I might apply for graduate school and and you know kind of do a, a similar path. And um, but at that point though, I I, I was in uh, the D.C. area, and so I, I went to uh, to graduate school in in, uh, in Arlington, Virginia. Um, so that's that's where I started that that path. 
um, ironically, at a at a Catholic university. <laughs> but uh, I mean, they 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 pretty much were were not very Catholic by by that point. In fact, yeah. I remember being in graduate school and like the most um, one of the uh, one of the most uh, shocking things was that the university had just elected like their their first uh, secular. Uh, president and the, one of the first things he did is he had all of the uh the crucifixes taken out of the classrooms and uh there were there were a lot of people who were like shocked and, and very angry about that wow so what was it what was what was it like getting into this profession for you did you find it did you find it life-giving um getting into starting to do starting to do therapy with people well, um, yeah, it, it, it was. Um, I, I found it life giving. I, I also found it. Um, I just found it in, interest, very interesting. Like it was just endlessly fascinating. Like I never got bored. Like that was kind of the, one of the things that I always found interesting about this profession. Other jobs I had worked. I'd go through periods where I'm like, ah, I'm just not into this anymore. I don't know if I yeah. want to do this anymore. I've never had that thought in, in counseling whatsoever. Huh. Um, it's just, it keeps me endlessly fascinated with, uh, yeah, with, with the human condition and, and human beings and, and how people react to different things. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why I, I started um, enjoying your, your, your channel so much was early on when, when you would have the, uh, the, the pot smokers outside your office, um, like that, that was basically my first job out of graduate school was working at a community mental health center. <laughs> and uh, my office was right outside the, the main entrance um, of this, uh, this human services office building. So you would have homeless people coming in and out all day yeah, long. Yeah. Some of them would try to camp like right outside my office. I yeah. have to go outside to kick them out. Yeah. I was like, oh, wow, I recognize that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have this fence now, so it's it's different. I don't know if it's a good thing or not, but it... Uh... It's, it's, I don't know, the way homelessness is going in Sacramento. I, I, I don't know if I could keep ahead of the other, but, um, wow. Yeah. Um, so, so how did, how did you find, how did you find me? Jordan Peterson? Are you watching Peterson? No, actually, I, I had a lot of clients that kept on asking me, do you, do you know Jordan Peterson? Have you ever you know, read any of his books? Um, and, uh, I did check out some of his, uh, some of his videos, but that's not how I, I came th through you through the Jonathan Peugeot uh, oh. pipeline, okay. uh, symbolic world pipeline. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I, I think I was just watching, I think I was watching a bunch of videos on just like Jungian um, symbols or something. And so, you know, the holy algorithm was like, Oh, well, if you like this, then, you know, maybe you'll like these videos. And uh, so I, I started, um, yeah, watching, um, the symbolic world and and just being very interested in that and then of course like you popped in there yeah. and i'm like oh what is this guy and so i watched a couple of your videos and uh i think where you hooked me in is yeah the, whatever video that you had early on that that where you said that the problem with the protestants is they never stop protesting and i'm like <laughs> wow that's, that's spicy and uh so yeah i, I uh you just, it's funny how like you just became part of my, my morning routine. Hmm. I, I would just, for whatever reason, I guess like your, your videos tended to come out uh, in the mornings on the, yep. the East coast. Yep. And so I would, you know, watch like a, one of your videos while just preparing my, my breakfast, um, setting up my coffee. Cause usually my first client isn't until like 10, 11 AM. Yep. So I have a lot of time in the morning. Yep. Um, so yeah, you just became part of my, my routine, but I, I, I felt like I have more of a parasocial relationship with you versus like some of the other podcasts I listen to, like, like Peugeot, like a lot of the, the other podcasters, I don't feel like I know anything about their lives. Like you're the only one that really talks about like your personal life and the other podcasters I listen to, I don't, I don't know anything about their personal. So it's more like watching, I don't know, a documentary or like a news program or something like that. <laughs> Whereas with you, it's a, it's a lot more personal. So, um, well, well, what do you want to talk about? Cause now I got a sense of you. So, um, so what happened with the religion thing? Are you, I mean, you're watching Peugeot. So did you start, 
thinking, having second thoughts about leaving religion or is this something that's sort of out there or what's, what's up with that? Well, uh, I, I just, I literally followed your, your advice, Paul. I just went to church. Oh, <laughs> Did you I, go to a uh, Catholic church? Uh, not initially. Initially, um, I mean, down where I'm at, there's like basically every flavor of like Protestantism. Oh, yeah. I mean, you've got, because you have a lot of, um, uh, East Europeans that came here for the, the, the fruit industry back in the sixties, uh-huh. you have basically every Orthodox Christian church you can imagine. I mean, you've, you've got Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, oh. Serbian Orthodox, oh. Romanian Orthodox. Um, so yeah, wh- whatever you're interested in down here, there, there's probably a church for it as well as I live like right near, you know, the, the corporate headquarters of Scientology. So I want to go in that direction. <laughs> very easily do that as well. So, um, well, when I, when I first moved down here, I, w- I was dating a woman who she was a, um, she was basically an evangelical uh, convert. She, she grew up in a secular household. She was from um, Great Britain originally, but grew up in a secular household. Um, you know, she uh, she she converted to Big Eva and um, started going to a, a mega church. And so she tried to make me go to her mega church. I was like, ah, you know, I'll, I'll give it a try. But man, you know, I walk in there and they've got like a coffee bar. And then, you know, once they, you know, break out like the rock music, I'm like, ah, I, I can't do this. <laughs> it's just, it's just, um. So, um yeah, I, uh, I, I started, um, I just started going back to, to, to Catholic mass mm. and, um, it, uh, I'll be honest with you, it didn't really do much for me, uh, mm. at first. Um, but there, there's also just so many, because you have so many snowbirds who come down in my area, there's just, there's a lot of, um, Catholic churches and there are, they're all very different. Um, some of them cater more to the Latin American community. Um, you know, some are, are clearly geared towards uh, the retirees. So each each church is 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 very different. But recently, I, I found a church where um, the 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 lead pastor is uh, is Nigerian, hmm. and um, I was able to have a, a coffee with him at one point. And he just talked about his experiences growing up in, in Nigeria, where like if you're Christian, like you have to be serious about it because, you know, you have uh, Muslim fanatics that are going to try to blow up your church or, yeah. or shoot your, your congregants. And so just hearing about his experiences was just uh, really amazing. I can't remember if it was you or Jonathan Peugeot. One of you guys talked about how um, more and more you're getting it, it used to be that. Um, you know, the Europeans went to Africa to evangelize the Africans, and now the Africans are yep. coming into the United States to, yep. to evangelize. Yep, that's that's happening yeah. all over. Yep, we've got and, a uh, we've got a Nigerian Anglican church here, and there's a there's a white guy. He's been on the Freddie and Paul show, and he's he's going to get baptized in the Anglican church next month. And I'm afraid we're kind of pulling him in though, because we serve donuts and they don't, and he likes donuts. So I think. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to get on bad terms with my Nigerian uh, Anglican priest. So, <laughs> yeah, they're, oh, they're, they're very passionate. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so he, he's, he's a he's a very good uh, evangelist. Um, normally, I, I tend to tune out during the, the homily, but um, I enjoy listening to his uh, his homily. Good. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been going to, to that church for a, a little while now. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. Um, but I think it, it would, it's really more about the older that I get, I find, um, it's important for me to, to connect with my, my ancestors. Yeah. Um, and that, that pull gets stronger and stronger, the older that, that I, 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 I get, um, you're not a Buddhist. You're not a Buddhist. <laughs> I tried. I really tried in my 30s. I, I went to a couple of sanghas and um, joined a couple of Buddhist groups. But then but then um, I, I was married for 10 years and, and I got divorced when I was about 40. And um, after my divorce, I took a, a trip, uh, a long trip to Southeast Asia and met like real, real Buddhists. Mm-hmm. I was like, wow, like you guys aren't like 
the American Buddhists. Not like that, the American they, Buddhists. Yeah, they don't they don't they don't practice the corporate Buddhism in, in places like Thailand. They're they're pretty militant. Um, so I was like, this is this is ridiculous. Like I always knew in my heart that it didn't matter like if I tried to practice the eightfold path or or any of that, that I, I was never gonna feel like a Buddhist. It was just yeah. Brother Adrian was right. He was right the entire time. And I, I should have listened to him, but I was young and stupid. Well, we don't listen when we're young. We don't know enough to we don't know enough to recognize wisdom when it's spoken to us. <laughs> right. Right. Well, what did what did you want to what did you want to talk about? I mean, you've satisfied my my curiosity about your story. Is there anything in particular you wanted to bring up or talk about? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I don't know if if you even have an answer for this, but um lately I've been getting a lot of um young male clients and when I say young like like 21, 22, 23, um you know the 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 zoomers generation Z. Yeah. Um and uh the these these young males they they um they all seem to have the the same story and it just it's it breaks my heart it, it's so difficult for me to to hear um you know so many of them are just they're 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 almost like shut-ins in that I'll ask them the same question. Like, well, you know, like you, like, tell me about yourself. What do you like doing? Like what kind of activity, what kind of hobbies are you engaged in? And they're like, Oh, I, I, I play video games at home. You know, I live with my, you know, my parents and it's like, okay, well, so you don't have any friends. No, I have, I have friends. Um, okay. Well, like other than video games, like what do you and your friends do well you know we'll go out like maybe twice a month you know to do yeah. something and i'm like so you know you're just sitting at home like you know the the entire time just playing video games and um yeah i i, I just uh it's just it, it's such a an alien experience from from how i i grew up and when i was in my 20s like when i was in my 20s i i'm an introvert like i i am not an extrovert but I was willing to go out to the clubs or to, you know, cause I knew that's where the girls were. So yeah. like, you know, I, I, I pushed myself out of my comfort bubble in order to, to, you know, seek the, the female race. Right. But I asked these young guys, like, what about, like, what about girls? What about, you know, young women? Well, I talked to some girls online <laughs> and yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I guess what my question to you is like, do you see anything within the greater Christian world on like how to, to deal with this? I mean, it's just, the reason why I asked is because um, I was reading some articles the other day about um, muscular Christianity yeah. back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I remember when I was in my early twenties, I worked out at a, uh, an old YMCA. And this YMCA had been a YMCA for like over a hundred years in this, this building. It was a very old building. And I remember the basketball court had an area where it looked like um, at one point a boxing ring had been set up because you could tell like where the posts had been, had been right. uh, taken out. And so I talked to the, at one point I, I was talking to the director of this YMCA. I'm like, did you guys have like a boxing ring in here at one point? He's like, oh, yeah, they, they had a boxing ring, you know, in there for for years. And it was like it was, you know, it was a huge Saturday night event. You know, all the young men would come and and they would either fight or or they would watch, um, you know, the boxing. And, you know, there was probably some gambling going on as well. But it was it was a you know, it was a huge event. It was a big draw. And I was like, well, like, why would you guys take it out? Like, what happened to it? He's like, well, back in the 70s, they were afraid of, you know, liability issues. You know, somebody gets hurt and sues the why. So, you know, we took out the, the, the boxing ring. And, you know, of course, they're the, the young male, you know, population after that, like, probably shrank. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I guess, like, is, is, does anybody have, like, an answer to that question in terms of, like, how do we how do we bring in these these young men who are clearly not getting anything from our current society? Our, our current society is just you know garbage essentially. It's yeah. just being fed into them. And does do any of the the Christian denominations, any of the churches, have 
any kind of answer in, in that area. Well, I would imagine porn would be an issue. That would be the sort of the top of my list. If you have young males who are staying home and in front of screens all the time, they might not, that might not be the first thing that comes out of their mouth. But as in your case with your story, what traditionally has driven men out of their homes is the search for women. And porn is this drug that basically, you know, if you want to, if you want to sort of emasculate a, you know, half of your population, porn pretty effectively does it. And um, so that, that would be, and, and so I think at least if young men are going to church and being raised in the church, whether or not they're doing porn, if they are doing porn, that at least they know it's an issue. Whereas I suspect further out in the rest of the culture, it's a given. And so that's not even a thing that's going to be addressed. And then following that is obviously computer games. And I I think churches, I think thick, strong church communities have at least a shot at uh, sending, sending the men out um, to do things. And at least even poorer communities and ethnic communities have more of a shot because there's not the financial buffer that will allow uh, a young male to freeload. And so then it's going to be pressure to go out and get work and bring in income and do something. And all of that too is going to be a, a a useful thing. Now, I'm, you know, I, I my youngest son is 23 and he um, is by no means, um, he doesn't spend hardly any time playing computer games. He doesn't spend a lot of time watching TV. He spends a lot of his time uh, with friends. And so almost pretty much every night he'll go out and he'll do things with friends and he likes uh, building stuff and working on stuff. And he's currently looking for, he just graduated from college, looking for a, more of a full-time job. And so I'm, I'm fortunate in that I'm not staring that in the face. Um, with one of my sons, he tended to spend a lot more time with computers and computer games and we put when he graduated from college my wife and i put a lot more pressure on him that he was not we knew that if he didn't we knew that if we didn't one way or another keep his you know keep the pressure on him in terms of bringing in income okay you can move back home but you're going to pay me rent and you're going to pay insurance on that car and you're going to start paying for that car and you know i i very quickly put the put the screws on him for money so that he would get out there and work. And eventually he did in fact get a job and he's, he's engaged right now and, and that's doing well. So I haven't had a lot of problem with that with my sons, but I do see it. And, um, and it, I think it is, I think it is a big problem. I, I, interestingly enough, um, I think, you know, Jordan Peterson obviously had a, big impact on this population, um, at least some of them. And and then it was interesting that when my local meetup here, one of the things that they wanted to start was a Discord server. And I had never heard of Discord. I had no idea what it was. But of course, it was video game adjacent in that that's where video gamers could meet and talk to each other. And so part of what we did with Estuary and with uh, the Discord server, which is sort of a half step to that, is again, helping helping guys discover that real people are way more interesting than computer games. And hopefully that real women are, they're way more complex, um, but also more rewarding in the long term, more meaningful than porn. So... I, that's not something that I necessarily, be, also partly because of my congregation, many of the people in my congregation, their children are my age, so they're dealing with other issues. So I, I am by no means um, ter tremendously experienced with, with the younger element. It's also interesting that my channel, people don't really start picking up on my channel until age 25 or 26 generally which is super interesting. So it's like they they stagnant and then at least something comes in and they realize they need they need a lift. They hit a wall and they have to go beyond. So 
I don't, I know that there are people my age who have sons in that age group. And I remember one friend of mine, he, this one son he had wasn't, his other sons had pretty much taken off okay, but this one was sort of stuck in what you just described. And then he started hearing Jordan Peterson coming out of his room. So he knew he was watching Jordan Peterson. And then he heard my voice. And so um, he thought, well, maybe something. I don't know. I don't know if he took off. But what you described is, I think, going to be a very serious thing. And unlike women, women can get stuck in that too. But I don't think like the guys. And um, I... Sometimes, sometimes guys need a provocation to break out of something like that. And I'm, I'm more, I'm more afraid of a situation where you've got a young man in a house with a single mother, because I think in a situation like this, often it would probably be the father that would look at that young man and say, no, we're not having this. And I, I, I fear, let's say, a divorced mom might coddle instead of figure out a way to get the kid out into the world. But I, I don't have any answers. But that's just off the top yeah. of my head. I, I just wish there was. It, it would be nice if if the churches could do, yeah, like have another revolution, like what the the YMCA did back in the eighteen hundreds, yeah. yeah. where you have you have a place where kids men young men especially can get involved in athletics sports they can be around each other in a healthy manner they can compete um that I, happens I, I, in I, the black community more and i think part of what provoked it and has uh, traditionally provoked it was young men that are idle are big trouble they get into problems with the law etc cetera, etc cetera. And that then mobilizes the community. I've seen that in the black community and, and where gangs are an issue because, because the problem is gangs then. <laughs> but what you're describing is affluent capture by porn, video games, and probably pot and alcohol that sort right. of become this one, this pen that's going to sap away years of their life. And again, by the time people sort of find me They've maybe been in it a few years and something has happened and they're trying to wake up. Yeah. But I don't know of anything, you know, besides mom deciding to go full mama bear and say, uh, by the way, there's no more internet in the house. You turn off that internet. Well, either he's going to learn to pick up a book or he's probably going to leave the house for something. So if I had to, if someone, if a mother came to me and said, this is my son, I would say, turn off the internet in your house. Try that. And I bet you something would change. You'd probably get a driver's license. And because boredom, don't. Boredom, use boredom. <laughs> yeah. and that internet's just killing them. But at the same time, I mean, there, there's clearly a lot of these young guys know that that they're missing out on something within within those particular areas, especially something like athleticism. I mean, you, yeah. how else could you explain somebody like the rise of like Andrew Tate, who's yeah. just, yeah. you know, you look at the guy and it's like, how, why are people attracted? Why are young men attracted to this guy? Well, he's, you know, former kickboxer and you know he's buff and um you know he clearly speaks to that that side of them that they know is 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 um is just not engaged yeah 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 no i agree i agree 100 percent. and i think within them there's something stirring but you and i both know motivation within people is a really tricky thing and if if people will often do what is easy, <laughs> and I think the internet is just so easy, and it's giving these substitutes for the real thing. Yeah. So yeah, I would tell mom, turn off that internet. Don't pay a smartphone bill. You know, and uh, to whatever degree, 
I mean, I I don't know how because I know other parents have had difficulty, but you know, I I always made my kids. There are exceptions, but generally speaking, you pay your way. You want a car, you know, maybe maybe I own the car, but you're going to pay the insurance, and then you're going to start paying me for the car. I mean, kids, they need they need a challenge. They need something out there, and um, nature provides that. <laughs> it's just we've. We've been, we're very wealthy. We're very affluent. Yeah. Well, the, the other issue that, that I see a lot of times um, with these, these young men is, yeah, it, whatever parent around is, is they're, they're fully engaged in whatever, whatever stressor in life that they're, oh, they're, yeah. dealing with. they're just kind of checked out as a parent. So, um, you know, trying to get them involved in, um, you know, helping their, their, their child move forward is, is a very, a very difficult task as a, as a therapist. Well, they land up with you because they want you to fix something. So I've often. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm totally the dad substitute. I, I've seen this again and again over the years. Well, and my wife, so my wife's a school teacher and it's gotten worse. You know, parents are afraid of their children they're afraid to say, I'm afraid my child won't like me. Right, right. Okay, exactly. well, yeah, you're going to have to risk that. And it might they might not like you for a while, but you're the parent. You're not their friend. They can have lots of friends. They've only got one parent. You're going to have to learn to do this. And, you know, and again, Peterson sort of came on with this and there's still a reaction to him. Well, well that's being mean. No, that's not being mean. Because the truth is you help raise that child and they won't wind up in jail. You, if, if the first person that says no to a kid is a cop, you have not done your job. <laughs> that doesn't mean that every kid's going to wind up seeing a cop, but I mean, that this is, and this is a, a systemic problem in our society right now. And it's getting worse. <laughs> yeah. Boundaries. It's all about boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries yeah. are being torn down in in every every sector of our society, yeah. from the families to the greater um, to communities, cities, cultures. Yeah. All and, all boundaries. Have to be and it's destroyed. driving my wife crazy because what's going on in the schools now is that schools are taking away the very limited set of things that teachers have, little things that pinch a little. And when I mean pinch, I mean, you're gonna lose some of your recess. No, you can't do that. And it's like, and then the, you know, then you talk to the parents. Okay, well, you, you know, why isn't, why isn't Johnny doing better in school? Well, you know, is, is, does Johnny have any reason to do better in school? And it's, it's, the, the difficulty is that, um, children are really going to suffer because yeah. of this. And if you yeah. start, if you start, yeah, I mean, Peterson's talked about this too. I mean, you start, you know, this. you start young when they're three and four and you start with very small things and they learn as they grow and they're not, not all kids are the same. Some will be more rebellious, some less. It's a very complex thing, but you know, it's, if you're if you're having to deal with this stuff when your kid is 21 it's a lot harder than having had to deal with it productively when they were 3 to 6 yeah if you do that work well when they're 3 to 6 when they're 21 i mean my children did not my children did not I mean, people always roll their eyes talk about teenagers and i don't want to be too judgy with respect to this cuz every kid is different but I, we didn't have any problem with our kids when they were teenagers. Um, and they, you know, they respected their parents. They feared their parents. They probably feared their mother more than their father in some ways. But I mean, it's, this is what parenting has always been. And and we as a culture have lost this and we're going to pay for that loss. And the, the problem is that often lessons learned too late have to be learned harder Right. Then when they were small and they, they sat down for a little time out and they learned that, well, you know, if you maybe do this good thing, then you don't get the time out. Then you get these other good things and, you know, you get little stickers and stars. And one of our children was probably the most difficult of the group to motivate. And, you know, we homeschooled. So we had to deal with that because 
you had them the whole time. And, you know, we had stars and stickers and, you know, you five stars for, you know, cleaning your room five nights in a row and you learn a little Lego toy or a matchbox car, you know, something small. I mean, it's just parents have been playing these tricks on kids forever and nobody sat me down and taught them, but you figure it out and you watch the kid and you kind of know where it goes. And, but yeah, and they're 21 or 22 and they're trapped by, you know, video games, porn and, you know, weed or alcohol. Yeah. You, you got a problem. And then usually it's probably going to be a 12 step program or, you know, something a lot tougher. Or jail. I mean, a, a lot of people in the in the city, well, you know this. Um, some go to jail and become lifers. Others go to jail and there's a shock, and maybe they find a maybe they find a street preacher or someone, and they turn around and you know they straighten out and they correct their life. It's, yeah, but there's no formula. You know, you'd love to give them a pill. <laughs> there ain't no pill. So I don't know if that's been helpful at all. It's probably everything you already know. <laughs> well, I'm glad we solved that issue, Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad we agreed that we have no solution for it besides everything that's always been. So I did have another question for you. I, this is just like curiosity on, on my part, but are people like constantly are 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 your listeners constantly um, contacting you and and asking you to convert to I don't know orthodoxy Catholicism or something because you seem to bring that up a lot whenever I, I turn on one of your videos like no I'm not going to convert to you know whatever it's like is is he getting hammered every day by people who are it's like not oh, you constant need... it's okay. it's regular <laughs> people can't figure out why I would you know, but, but all of that's projection, you know, We're, screens work on projection. And, you know, especially when my beard is long, <laughs> people are like, oh, he's, he's already got the beard. Why isn't he Orthodox? It's like, well, and, uh, you know, Muslims and some certain, certain Jewish friends of mine are particularly, uh, persistent in these areas, but, um, even though claiming not a proselytizing religion, but, uh, but why do you still it, those those tribal those tribal games are they're, they're just normal when someone when a high profile person um, aligns with whatever tribe you align with it feels like a win in the universe and that your team is winning so uh, it's just okay but it's not it's it's not a it's not a big deal I mean I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have my own mind. And, um, and, and people's, you know, even though I, I probably am a little bit more transparent in terms of my life and a whole bunch of other areas of my life than let's say maybe Jonathan, um, there's whole ranges of my life that if, you know, what's so funny is that I have a church here and you I mean to, to meet me, I mean, if you, if you want to have a zoom call, that's that's kind of tough because there's maybe four or five slots that I have that can get filled uh, a week. But if you want to meet me, just walk in at nine o'clock on Sunday morning and, you know, you can set up chairs and but that's you got to be here then. And then and then it's suddenly a little demystified, you know, just a just a regular guy and normal people. And, you know, I might be a big deal on the Internet, but here on Florin Road, I'm I'm a rando. So it's good. It's good. I, I like it that way. I, when I think about what Jordan Peterson's been through, gosh, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. Can't go to the store. Can't, you know, you know, whatever, because people are going to stop you and that level of fame, that's got to suck. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't imagine that's, that's, that's gotta be, that's gotta be really difficult to just try to live your life without being in a, a, a fishbowl essentially yeah yeah well did we did we check off any any you know everything that you wanted to uh touch on at least for today uh yeah yeah um i i uh i certainly went into uh everything that that i wanted to to go into i mean certainly if you have any more questions i'll be more than happy to to answer them um 
kind of disappointed that that Jonathan Peugeot didn't become Roman Catholic. You know, it's just, it's just like, like, man, come on. He's still young. Maybe, maybe. Uh, I don't know. For to go back. The whole icon. You carving. should write him. Dear Jonathan, have you considered returning to the Catholic Church? Maybe if I do it in French, he will. There uh, you go. He will pay more attention. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe maybe it's maybe it's Matthew you should work on because he seems uh he seems less committed to a to a body right now. So work on work on Matthew. I, I was following him on Twitter for a little while and he's uh, <laughs> Matthew's kind of out there. Yeah, he's out there. Oh, the the world people will like. I mean, it's good to hear you say you like your job because. People are interesting. The day you're a therapist or a pastor and you no longer find people interesting, you should definitely get a different line of work because um, people are interesting. And once you once you get a chance to know them and sort of see the world through their eyes, you know, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's funny when when I when I first started listening to you, I just happened to get a a client who was a a, a pastor, and so like listening to you and also sort of just you know um, having him as a client, getting that like inside baseball sort of point of view in terms of being a pastor at a yeah. church, yeah. like what kind of pressure you know yeah. your average pastor is is uh, is under, and um, just him trying to like deal with that 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 stress uh it was it was a pretty amazing uh experience just to have him as as a client and just have, getting to hear all of that yeah as a protestant pastor in america you it, it's it can become sort of a service a service industry and that's it's it's you know, you have that to a degree as a therapist too. If your client doesn't like you, they won't, you know. But as a church, it's this big, it's or this 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 group of people and they pay your salary. And there's a lot of there's a lot of things that can that can get involved. And it's not getting any easier because in when my grandfather and my father's day, the tradition sort of carries you. And as these traditions sort of evaporate. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, uh, I mean, I know he wasn't, uh, he wasn't reformed, um, but he was part of some sort of organization because they had, his church had elders. Yeah. Um, so, but like just the, the internal politics, like many of the elders didn't like him, but the, 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 the larger congregation did like him. Oh. So you had like this, this tension that, you know, he's trying to deal with and he's trying to, to navigate and. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was just very very political. I was like, wow, yeah. wow, wow. Well, Aaron, it was it was good to meet you, cop turned therapist. Um, I'll, I'll 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 send you the recording and and then we can see what we want to do with it. All right, sounds good. It was great meeting you. You know, like I said, after you know listening to you all these years in the morning to finally like meet you and have a little bit of a normal relationship rather than being like, well, he doesn't even know I, I exist. And I, I know all about his life it just feels weird. Oh, it's, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. That's, that's what's fun for me about these conversations. It's, I, I just said to, I was just talking to someone right before I was talking to you. I mean, it's just talking into the camera. Isn't that much fun. It's much more fun when the camera talks back. So. Yeah. All right, Aaron, take care. You too. Bye. Bye-bye.